Welcome to HR Visionaries, where we unlock the secrets of modern HR. I'm Benjamin, your host. Join us as we shed light on today's HR universe with HR leaders and innovators from across the globe. Whether you're an HR pro, a business leader, or just curious about the future of work, this is your shortcut to the forefront of HR innovation. Brought to you by Hire, the AI talent attraction platform. Yeah, welcome to our new podcast episode. Today we are at Zalando's headquarter here in Berlin and we have Jeff with us from uh, Early Careers at Zalando. Thanks. Awesome. No, thank you for having me. You know, welcome to the mothership of fashion here in Berlin uh, at our BHQ. So yeah, super excited to have you here today. It's pretty cool to be here. Thanks a lot for, for, for inviting us here. Yeah, no worries. Um, so can you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am from California originally, uh, but uh, I've been living in Europe since 2008. Uh, so we, we, which part of California are you from? I'm from just, uh, well, it's, nobody really knows, but it's called Temecula, California. So it's wine country and it sits between San Diego and L.A. So uh, I'm a, kind of a SoCal Valley boy here. Well, <laughs> That's maybe, what they say. Well, for European perspective, it looks like, okay, San Diego is basically a suburb of Los Angeles, but yeah, it's, it's kind yeah. of not, right? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> massive. But I have to say San Diego is one of the most beautiful cities. And it's a bummer that most people skip it because they'll go direct from Europe into L.A. and then they go north uh, from L.A. and they miss probably one of the best cities in California. You have this large naval base, right? Uh, yeah, so that's actually where uh, Top Gun was filmed, actually, that just came out. So <laughs> I used to work just right around the corner from Mirabar Air Airfields Air Base, where a lot of that was filmed. Um, but yeah, it's a huge naval base. The Navy SEALs trained there. And then there's a huge Marine Corps de uh, deployment there called Camp Pendleton. Uh, and my dad was in the Marines, and that's where why we were in California, because he was stationed in Camp Pendleton. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. And <clears throat> so... Why did you then leave California? So, so many people, so in particular, like German celebrities, kind of like California. So they moved from Berlin to California. Even. Yeah. Kind of like did the Heidi Klump inverse. So yeah. Before. So it's it's funny story. So I started on a graduate program myself uh, with Enterprise Rent a Car when I left university. So I was with Enterprise in California, working my way up their grad program. And then, as most Americans do, they have their first European trip where you use all your holidays in one year in, in a two-week two time span because we don't get many holidays in the States, of course. And I did, I think I was 26, did that trip to Europe, did London, Paris, Venice, Florence, Rome, and back, and just fell in love with London and said, you know what, I want to live here one day. I don't know how, but I'm going to live here. And then I get back, and then Enterprise rent a grad program and everything, it's all internal promotions. And an internal role came open for a role in London uh, at Heathrow Airport as branch manager. So... I put my name in the hat for it, not even thinking I would ever get a chance to go or get it, considering you know Enterprise being such a large organization. Um, and it came down between me and another person, and she actually got the role, and I didn't. So I went on Friday being rejected for the role, and then on Monday they called me and offered me a different role instead, uh, which was a branch in Ellsbury. Um, and I, I remember asking myself, Ellsbury, where is that? I was like, oh, it's just North London. Uh, needless to say, it was an hour north of London <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. And I always had this ongoing joke. I was like, yeah, you know what? California to Ellsbury. They told me there was palm trees and I fell for it. It went, <laughs> right? Uh, but, it, you know, I moved in November and it was probably the most challenging and adjustment I've ever had to make. You know, I remember like it was a bad winter. It was snowing. Uh, I don't know how to drive in the snow from California. <laughs> slide all over the motorway. And one day at work, I actually... Got stuck on a motorway. It took me four hours to get to work and ended up sliding my car in a ditch. And I remember calling my boss. I'm like, why am I in Ellsbury? Where am I right now? I don't know how to drive in snow. Like, I'm in a company car. I'm like, do you really want me driving this car in the snow? But, uh, but yeah, I made that move in 2008 to London um, and worked with Enterprise. And then I ended up in Scotland. Uh, so when I was in London, that's when I made the move from rental internally into talent acquisition and recruiting with the universities. Because... They approached me and said, I think, you know, we think you'd be great for recruiting and uh, recruiting for the grad programs because I had a great story to tell that I worked my way up. I went from California to London uh, and we were obviously selling this massive opportunity. So I started doing that, fell in love with it, then got asked to head up recruitment for Scotland and Northern Ireland. So once again, I was like, all right, this California boy is heading up to Scotland. Never been there before, but, you know, moved up there for two years. And at that point is when, you know, I hit that ceiling. I've been with Enterprise for 13 years. 
uh, and I got uh, head onto the parade role with FDM Group uh, for head of recruitment for UK and Ireland uh, for their grad program. So I moved back down to London, um, and yeah, and loved that role. And then you know, I think everyone in their career at some point gets this tap on the shoulder for a role. And I had a headhunter friend, and you know, he reached out and says, "I have this role." And I always said, "You know, I'm not looking, but if there's something really cool that comes mm-hmm. along, like you know, let me know." You know, exactly. and uh, so I get that tap, and I start having conversations, and it was with N26. <laughs> N26 wanted to build out this early careers future talent program, uh, and also want to build out a tech academy, and how do we find diverse talent? And train them ourselves to become software engineers to help bridge that gap. So sold me on the role. I was like, oh, this is really cool. And they're like, oh, by the way, it's in Berlin. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I was like, Berlin? I don't speak German. He's like, no, it's okay. You don't need to speak German. I was like, okay. Uh, and I loved Germany. I was already at FDM Group managing a team in Frankfurt. So I was in Frankfurt a lot for work. Uh, and lo and behold, after you know coming over to Berlin, I learned very quickly that Frankfurt is Germany. Berlin <laughs> Probably not so German as Frankfurt was. So, you know, it was a huge shock, but, you know, I made that move. And, and I think as a lot of people across the la- over the last couple of years had a lot of challenges. And, you know, at N26, when Corona hit, I got put on Kurzweil bite and got left in this limbo and not knowing what's going on. And then some up reached out to me, uh, said, hey, you know, we want you to do for us what you were doing at N26. So I called N26, like, what's happening? Am I coming back to work soon? You know, originally, I think everyone thought, oh, we'll only go on Cursor Bite for just a month, and then we'll be back. It'll be all over. Yeah. Four months later, still nobody knows what's going on. And my boss, you know, very open, and, you know, uh, Chris Bell, and he's fantastic, and said, you know what, Jeff, I would take the job. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I did. And so I went to Sum Up, and then nine months later, got laid off from Sum Up, unfortunately. And that's what brought me here to Zalanda. So I'm always a firm believer everything happens for a reason. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm loving my time here at Zalando. I think it's a fantastic company. I love the culture. I love, you know, the diversity within it. And those are some of the two key things really important to me when I'm looking at, you know, which company do I want to go to? And then the one big most important thing is that diversity piece. So, yeah, long story short, it's been a wild roller coaster. If you've ever been to Disney World, I always say it's like <laughs> wild, Mr. Toad's wild adventure, right? You know, you never know what's going to happen and where your life takes you. But I think... You know, for all those looking at careers, you have to look at the opportunity, not always be fixated on maybe where you're living, but is the role going to give you joy and happiness and excite you for what you do every day? Yeah, I, I think it's a very important point you, you, you talked about. So like you, well, this geographic uh, issue around moving from California to the UK, well, uh, I actually forgot the name of the city. Ellsbury. Of Ellsbury. Ellsbury, uh, yeah. I honestly never heard about it. So yeah, but... me either. <laughs> I looked on the map and like, it looks close to London. But, uh, but yeah, it was interesting. But I think, you know, for me, I, I was raised a lot differently. I was, you know, a military kid. Uh, my dad, you know, was moving us all over the world. I lived in Hawaii for three years. I graduated high school in Okinawa, Japan. You know, so I was always used to just my picking up my life. I mean, some places we only lived 10 months and we moved again. Uh, you know, so I think that's made me a very eclectic person, very diverse person that, you know, you could throw me in any situation, I'll find my way. Uh, and I think that's why I've been so open, you know. So I, I actually, my parents are like, you live so far away. I was like, well, it's your fault. You dragged me all over the world. So, you know, and I just fell in love with finding and enjoying and living in new places. So. But having that flexibility has really helped me move my career very quickly. Yeah. And that's what I appreciate. Uh, how do you think can people adopt this spirit? Because um, obviously here in, in Germany and in general in Europe, it's not that common to move around like in the US. Like you, you find a great job in Arizona and you move from New Jersey to California. Yeah. Or to Arizona in that case, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so that's not that common over here in, in Germany or in Europe. So do you have any idea how one could um, how could adopt to this openness to, 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 to say, well, if there is a great opportunity coming along, um, well, I have my friends in my hometown. However, I can, of course, make good friends in the town I'm going to. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough one. I think it, it working, is, right? yeah, yeah, working and living abroad is not mm. for everybody. I, I've actually met some Americans that moved to Berlin during COVID uh, and lockdown. They came well, for a job. Tough, right? Yeah, and but they mm. left. They didn't last yeah. a year. Yeah. You know, and I, I get it's hard being with family. I think what's interesting is like when I, because even like 
when we left Japan and I went to University of West Florida, my dad got orders to Anniston, Alabama, which is in the middle of nowhere. It's like living in the middle of Germany, not near any cities, right? Uh, and I said, I refuse to live in the middle of nowhere. I'm going to the beach down in Florida to go to university. Lo and behold, I was right because my dad only lasted less than a year in Anniston, Alabama, and then got orders back to California. But at that point, I was already established at university. I loved it. I had friends, so I stayed, and they went to California. So, you know, and even then, it was really hard because we didn't have these FaceTiming. You know, our internet was like Ethernet. Uh, you know, you had the dial tones, and then I remember buying for Christmas and mailing a webcam to my parents, and every now and then you get a, a shot where you could see them, you know, and that was how communication was but I think now with technology it's so much easier like you know for me I have um, this Amazon Prime um, it's like little box with a screen and I bought one for my parents in their kitchen so I can say you know you know Alexa drop in uh, to mom in the kitchen and, and it'll pop in the screen and so I'm cooking you know dinner she's cooking breakfast and we have a chat and so it's like still being together and stuff so um, but it is not for everyone and I think you know, but I've always been a firm believer that you only live once, you know, and I want to live life as full as I can get it. And, you know, being in a military brat and moving all over, I've seen as much of America as I want to see. So I figured like that chapter is closed. People ask, are you ever going to go back to America? I'm like, no, you know, I think there's so much more I want to see and explore in, 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 in Europe and elsewhere. Um, so I think do your research to make sure like, do you connect to that country? You know, maybe try to connect to some other expats you know, that you may know or have friends that know and just speak to them what it's like living in that country to see if it's right for you. Um, but like I moved to Berlin and only have been to Berlin for 24 hours for my interview. Yeah. Uh, so I had no idea like what it was like moving. But and even when I moved to London, I was I moved to London with six suitcases and an air shipment of 400 pounds. You know, that was my life. I just threw it in the, on the plane and away I went. And I only been to London on holiday for two nights, three days before I jumped on a train to Paris. So you know, and it, everyone's like, that must be scary. It was like, you know what? I, I'll meet people. Like, that's just me, right? Like, exactly. it's tough. And it's probably also like, well, looking more at the opportunities instead of like what would hold you back. So uh, probably I think what, what most people kind of underestimate is there is always a way back, right? So yeah. it's not like, well, if you don't like it, as you, as you told, uh, told before about the, those Americans who came to, to Berlin uh, during COVID were probably really tough, not connecting with yeah. anyone. So you can also then go back. And I think it's also for, for many European kids. So there's always the opportunity to come back to, yeah. you, to your hometown if it didn't like yeah, it. Yeah, just at least try went, it, right? Exactly. Because yeah. you hate to go through life and then realize mm -hmm. you had an opportunity to take it up and mm -hmm. the only chance you could go to that city is just on mm -hmm. holiday. But the fact that you could go there and live there and experience it, yeah, you can always go back. But how much better does that look for your career on your CV that you've had that international exposure? Because then it really shows that you could work in a multicultural environment or actually work in any environment, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, I highly recommend if you ever have the chance, even if it's for one, two years, you know, even if you could go with your company on maybe a one-year exchange, I'd always highly recommend doing it. So how do, would you compare working in the U.S., the U.K., and, and Germany? So when I watch, for example, TV in U.K. or the Americas, it's in, in America, it, it's always like between U.K. and the U.S., it's kind of... Yeah, kind of very similar. So yeah. Nigel Farage appears on Fox News basically <laughs> yeah, every, yeah. every other week, right? And um, well, the the exchange between in, in terms of culture between uh, Europe uh, or let's say Germany and continental Europe and the US and also the UK is of course a bit different. So yeah. um, so how would you compare working and living in those three countries? Yeah, I think you know I instantly fell in love with working in Europe because I think. You know, in America, like, for me, it was just work, work, work. We didn't get many holidays. Yes, you do 40 hours a week, but you end up doing 60 hours a week. Yeah. And what I appreciate in Europe, particularly in Germany, is that it's very structured. Yeah. You know, you, the employees are really protected by the law. Like, if you're 40 hours contract, you work 40 hours and you get X amount of holidays. I remember the first year when I moved to Europe, uh, you know, I went and visited the head of HR at Enterprise, just getting a brief of, like, the different law differences and things that I needed to know as manager. And then she was like, oh, by the way, did we tell you about your holiday? I was like, oh, yeah, two weeks a year. She's like, no, Jeff, you get 30 days. And I about <laughs> fell out of my chair. I was like, what do you mean 30 days? I was like, am I being punked here? What's going <laughs> on? I thought I was like on a hidden camera show or something. He's like, no, Jeff, you, you got 30 days. I'm like, no. 
Uh, <laughs> and then I remember my first year, like in December, I get a call from HR. I was like, hey, Jeff, um, I just want to talk to you about your holidays. I was like, oh, yeah, I've, man, I've had so many amazing holidays this year. She's like, no, Jeff, you still have six more days you need to take by the end of the year. I'm like, are you sure? I took a lot of holidays. Did you count right? He's like, Jeff, you have six more days to take. I'm like, oh, all right. So last minute, took six days off and didn't want to travel around the UK for a little bit. So, you know, I think that culture, that work-life balance really exists, I think, in Europe and particularly in Germany uh, versus in America. I didn't really, I think, get that. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's I, I like it much more here. So that's something I also find very interesting when, when living in the US so compared to, to Europe. I wouldn't say that Europeans are lazy, not at all, of course, but yeah. like Americans work actually a lot, right? So also on the weekends, so even if you have an office job, you actually do a lot of work on the weekends and um, yeah. that can, of course, also be quite, quite tiring, right? Yeah, it is very tiring. I remember doing a lot of work on the weekends and stuff, but I think, I don't know, I've heard a couple stories of like differences. I don't necessarily think this pertains to me, but I think... Some people in America will work extremely hard because it's really easy to fire somebody. You know, yeah. if you're my boss and I showed up late for the third day in a row or I've ticked you off that day, you can just say, you know what, you're fired, get out of here. And there's like no repercussions just on the day you're fired. But like in Germany, you know, and in Europe in general, it's really hard to dismiss somebody from their job. Mm -hmm. So I think people go above and beyond and work extra hard and always want to be seen working really hard so they're not at risk. And I heard there's other countries that are similar to that kind of kind of culture and not necessarily fear but you know i think it's you know it's something i think you don't want to get your head around you just want to you know go in and do your job and do it well yeah. and not have to do it to impress them because you're afraid you get fired one day or something so you, you talked about diversity here at zalando yeah. and then maybe maybe that actually kind of gets us there where we just talked about so like this culture of fear so is is nowadays kind of replaced with a culture of empowerment with a culture of diversity with a culture of yeah, encouragement yeah. um so um how has it also changed in the u.s and then maybe, maybe we can talk a bit about how this actually works at salando so what would impress you in terms of diversity here? yeah i mean i think i think in, in the states and we've seen a lot of what's going on in america and i think there's still a long <laughs> journey that they need to take when it mm -hmm. comes to diversity um but what i've seen here in zalando and You know, the diversity here is amazing. Uh, I, you know, feel comfortable working here. I love, you know, the, you know, everyone being so different, but we have this thing of come as you are, be as you are type of mentality. Like, you know, and, and that's what I love. You know, I think you, there's so many different diversity ERGs. Everyone's really open to a lot of the diversity initiatives that I've launched. You know, for example, we have our Anon initiative, uh, which we're a huge sponsor of uh, with the organization called Anon ADAN. Uh, and it's an organization that's supporting people of color that have migrated here to Germany, you know, and, and those type of initiatives, you know, Zalanda is so supportive and really wanting to bring this type of diversity into the organization. Uh, and that's what I love. And I think you see that I, I always tell students when I go and speak to my campus that if you really want to know what the diversity and the power diversity really is as Zalando, just go on YouTube and watch any of our uh, Zalando uh, campaigns because Every group is always represented in those campaigns. And every time I watch them, it just, you know, I got a smile from ear to ear because it just makes me proud working for that organization when you see that kind of diversity. And I haven't seen that in any other organization, particularly in ad campaigns. I think Zolanda really pushes, you know, that envelope when it comes to diversity. Yeah, for me, diversity is also like everyone feels comfortable working yeah. there. So that therefore, the, we, as, as we talked about culture of fear before, I think that's actually kind of the worst culture you can possibly have. So yeah. when people come in in the morning, are frightened about their bosses and are not like empowered to be who they are. So how they could they potentially be good employees in terms of good output. So that, that is, is also kind of, I think, the topic of diversity is kind of selfish from both sides, right? So it helps both sides. So yeah. employer and employee, of course. And it just really helps, you know, an organization get the best out of their people. Mm -hmm. If somebody is that comfortable being who they are, you see the best version of themselves uh, mm -hmm. in the workplace and actually drives that fun and energy and culture that you want in an organization. Because I've seen, you know, in other organizations, not necessarily ones I've worked with, but I've seen in other organizations where 
a culture could just be toxic, yeah. you know, and that's not a fun environment. And, you know, when I am applying for jobs or I get headhunted for a job, the first thing I look at is I go and maybe look at Glassdoor or I look at see, you know, what reviews to kind of get an idea of what is the culture like in that organization. Uh, and it's like, I did the same thing with Zalanda. The first thing I went, I actually went on YouTube to see the videos. And I was like, oh, wow, this is interesting. It's like, is the diversity really like that at Zalando? And then I did a little bit more digging and realized actually it really is a diverse culture. And having some friends that have worked here, you know, can vouch for that as well. I think there's an ongoing joke if you throw a, a rock in Berlin, the odds are you're going to hit somebody from Zalando because there's so <laughs> many of us here. So always somebody has a friend of a friend of a friend or somebody that works at Zalando. So it's really easy to kind of reach out and pick somebody's brain about the culture and what it is actually working here at Zalando. Um, working at Zalando. Uh, so um, I think Zalando is a very interesting company in terms of everyone knows you. Everyone uses your products. I, I think in particular those who listen and, and watch us. Well, I think literally everyone, but what can I actually do at Zalando? So, um, yes, so you have so many touch points with Zalando, but I actually have no idea other than other than you. I haven't met that many people from Zalando. So, so what can I do at Zalando? Yeah, I mean, we have so many different yeah. departments and areas across Zalando. And I'm so curious to find out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's even me, like I've been at Zalando. Mm -hmm. I just had my one year anniversary in July. And there's still areas of the business that I haven't probably learned yet. Um, but I think there's some really cool, interesting things about Zalando, you know, because Zalando has a couple different entities. So, you know, for example, um, for us in early careers, we uh, work a lot with Zalando Marketing Services, which is a, a separate entity to Zalando. And actually, they're a huge advocate for us in the early careers. We've hired a lot of interns for them, uh, and they've converted a lot of interns to full time. And it's really cool to see what they do, working very closely with the brands, you know, building out some marketing campaigns to position the products in front of the right people, uh, looking at a lot of that data analytics. You know, you know, where's the, you know, where, how can we position a product where, you know, we can get the biggest return for, for the partners. And uh, so I think what they do is super interesting. Uh, but we are a tech company. A lot of people say, oh, Zalando is fashion. But then they we're, we're tech, you know, and, and all that thing, all, everything that you do on our app can't be done without the amazing technical teams that we have supporting behind it, giving the users a fun shopping experience. They're not going into a store. But guess what? You can still have fun shopping online uh, and actually really enjoy it and really making that experience pleasurable. Because I feel like as an ongoing joke when I speak to students uh, and I speak to thousands of students every year, I always say, I feel like I'm Zalando's target customer because <laughs> I'm a big American guy. I hate shopping online because I have to try on everything. And I'm like, I always have to return things when I shop online because nothing fit. I want to go into a store, make sure it fits, and then I'll buy it. Uh, and then coming to Zalando and the first time I bought something, it fit. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then I bought something else and it fit. And because of the technology behind the platform and the size and fit, you know, and the recommendations of based on your past purchases and your returns, we recommend you buy this size. It's so intuitive that it actually gets it right. For me, being a bigger guy, it makes a world of a difference. So, you know, there's so much that goes on in Zalando working from our, with our partners, our customer care centers, our logistics. Uh, there's so many different areas across Zalando and a lot of opportunities as well. So, you know, you go on our website and our career site, you can see all those different opportunities that are spread across the Zalando businesses. Yeah, I find this incredibly interesting in terms of you connect something that is like highly emotional. So I know, know so many people whose like favorite hobby is, yeah, well, I'm gonna spend like, yeah, well, I've done a lot of work today, so I spent like half an hour on Zalando webpage and um, that's kind of their hobby and um, so you connect something like a feeling or great emotions with great technology so that's, yeah. that's actually quite a remarkable achievement yeah I mean I actually you know I was already a Zalando customer before I joined Zalando as many people are and actually always I think Zalando is probably the one website I've only bought clothes off of because I was never comfortable, you know, even in the UK, we have some competitors there. I never shopped on their websites. I didn't trust it. Uh, and then I come to Berlin and I was like, okay, this is interesting. And maybe lockdown forced a little bit of that, right? Because you yeah. had to shop online. But, you know, when I got introduced to Zalando, I was like, wow, this is actually really cool. This is fun. And, you know, and then, okay, I bought something and it was super fast and it fit. I was like, oh, this is cool. That's never happened before. So, um, it's definitely, you know, I was a, definitely a solid customer before joining you on that. <laughs> and how, how is it, it it's a London when you look at those trends? So as you said, so for example, during lockdown, um, well, 
you had to shop online, this, but on the other hand, of course, people went out less, so therefore they probably were not that interested in getting so much stuff every, um, every week or so. Yeah. Um, so and, and now that everything has reopened, and hopefully it stays open, mm -hmm. uh, so that people are super hungry first to go out, but also to sometimes also shop offline. Well, not, not me, I really hate shopping offline. Yeah. So, uh, it, uh, but, but there are those people who, who are then going to the large department stores now. So, so how yeah. does Zalando manage those large trends? Well, I mean, they think about like, Zalando always had a strong customer base, right? So, you know, even before the pandemic, we still had a large customer yeah. that were still shopping online. And I think that's what really helped Zalando during the pandemic because, you know, we already were getting it right before a pandemic. And the pandemic just obviously enhanced that and made it better. But, you know, I think, you know, we always find ways to make adjustments in the business. And I think Zalando is very forward thinking in that way. Uh, and in a way, almost trying to predict those trends so we could, you know, so that we could be proactive versus reactive. Uh, and I've, I'm seeing that now in the organization and I've seen it in other organizations as well. Um, and I think, you know, for graduates out there looking for jobs, I think these are the kind of important things to really look for an employer, do some research to get some understandings uh, to make sure it's the right company uh, for you, but also the company you're joining is strong, it's stable, you know, they're, they're very, you know, proactive in everything that they're doing versus, you know, we've seen recently across Berlin, lots of layoffs because yeah. everything that's going on. And I think those are just companies that are just being very reactive because yeah. they didn't forward plan, they didn't think or plan for that kind of situation. And easy for them just to hit that panic button and hit a release, right? Um, and I think that's super important. And what's great about working at Zalando, we try as much as possible to not predict the future, but we try to you know be proactive in different situations. At, at Zalando, do you also then have like a development plan for every individual so that, that you can make sure you can grow grow organically, however then coached and guided by yeah. others? Yeah, so with our early career programs that we have, we call them Future Zalants. Uh, Zalants with a Z. <laughs> I love that. Uh, right? You know, we like to put some Zs on things. <laughs> um, but, you know, we have this saying in our department is learn with us, grow with us, right? You know, so come in. You seize the opportunity you have in your internship to learn as much as possible. Uh, we have an amazing L&D team here at Zalando, uh, and we've highlighted a lot of different courses that um, our, our Zalans can, can sign up and take as part of Zalando when it comes to like time management and growth mindset and you know all these things that really help that, that uh, Zalans go from university, that transition from university to work because it's different. You know, there's some students that come in there with that mindset of still being in uni and they haven't quite transitioned to now it's work. You know, and we really try to give them all the tools needed to help them make that transition. Um, so when I joined a year ago, um, really just kind of started really building out the early career programs uh, mm -hmm. here. And that was one of the key things we really wanted to align. And we're still doing some work and we still got a lot of work to do when it comes to that development uh, because we want to kind of give it to them on a silver platter to help with their conversion, right? If you have an intern or a working student comes in, does a fantastic job, works at the best, they have a higher probability of getting a full-time contract at the end. Uh, so we want to give the tools necessary to really allow them to show their true best selves and their performance. So um, when you when you hire people, so what are the things you're looking after? So in, in US, obviously, like big tech is like incredibly selective, uh, looking only at the Ivy League school. So uh, how, how does Salando approach this? Yeah, so we don't look at the Ivy League schools. I, I say we, we participate and we support mm -hmm. all universities. I know... There are some organizations, and I've seen it in the past, and you know that were like, we want to go to the top universities for the top degree programs uh, to get the best of the best students. Well, guess what? You're not going to get a whole lot of diversity with that either. Exactly. You know, particularly when you look at those and they're like that fall under social mobility. Like for me, I was first in the family to go to university. I didn't go to a top grade university. Uh, university of West Florida was like a very kind of slightly low military university, mm -hmm. but you know it was cheap. It was close to Alabama. Um, you know, we, my parents didn't have a lot of money and I didn't have scholarships. I had to pay for university myself. And as you know, in America, university is quite expensive uh, compared to being in Europe. <laughs> yeah, a little expensive. So, you know, for me, like we try to target universities who produce students that align with 
is a lot better. Uh, we try to work with universities that have the best diversity makeup. Um, and, and, you know, students pick universities for many different reasons. You know, uh, it's not just because it's the best of the best universities, because it's close to home, it's cheaper. You know, people still have family obligations. And, you know, and I think for us in the graduate recruitment market, and particularly for our team, it is our responsibility to go out there and find the talent. Mm-hmm. You know, so you could go to any university, you could still find amazing people at that university. And, you know, and I think because of that, it's really helped reinforce that diversity coming into Solando from the very entry level stage. So, um, yes, we work with some top tier universities, but yeah, we work with the universities that, you know, are a little bit lower on the table as well. And I think that's important. And I, you know, any employers listening to this, I would highly recommend that don't just build a campaign that's only targeting top universities yeah. because that's it's not going to help drive the sometimes the right culture or, or diversity within your organization. And um, so when when you then talk to uh, young talents so what is what are the key qualities you're looking after yeah it's a great question so you know when we're looking at interns or a working student we understand that you're not going to have a whole lot of experience yet but what we do look for is those transferables so what experience have you gained that is transferable to the job uh, but then also like What other extracurriculars have you done? How are you making best use of your time at university? I love hiring people that are super active on campus. They're part of this organization, this club. They do this sports team. You know, they really have integrated themselves, not just in the study, but they do a lot because it already shows signs of maybe leadership and work ethic and being able to work with different cultures or a lot of different people. Uh, they show that they're a team player. You know, there's all these really great transferable uh, soft skills, critical skills that they develop by doing that that can really support them in the role. So, you know, we're not necessarily looking for a world of experience, but maybe a little bit of experience, but never, you know, underestimate the experience you've gained at university. Because I've had students say, Jeff, I really want to work for Zalanda, but I don't have much experience. Like, well, what have you done? They're like, ah, uh, well, I work at a cafe. I was like, well, why do you feel that working at a cafe is not worthy enough of experience for Zalando? Well, I don't know. It's just a cafe. I was like, but time management, your work ethic, there's all these things that you've gained that's important to me. And they always undervalue those type of roles. So I think, you know, really bring all of that out in the interview. I'm really great to say that because that's also what, what I've been telling students all the time. Well, if you worked at McDonald's, if you worked in Rewe, wherever, put this on your CV because it yeah. says so much about your personality that you are able to, well, to show up for work, which is, well, it's uh, perhaps not as, not as, not as cool as working for, uh, for big, Uh, a big fancy company yeah. uh, to, 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 to put stuff um, on the shelves but it's like super important yeah. and you, you probably learn so many qualities there that others don't have yeah. and um, yeah I, I also um, discuss that quite often when, when we have uh, people applying for, 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 for jobs at Hyatt also that uh, well yeah I just work at McDonald's yeah But that's great. Yeah, never say just here. Like, it's all a great experience. Like, I tell students, like, listen, if you don't have literally any work experience, you haven't been in clubs or worked in a coffee shop, then I really hope you're getting straight A's. Uh, (laughs) Because what else are you doing at university? You know, for me, like, you know, I didn't have the best grades in the world. Um, I had to work three jobs to put myself through university. And this is where the system, I think, is really broken, particularly in America, because I kept getting passed up for graduate jobs because I didn't have a certain GPA. Now, because I didn't have that GPA, didn't mean I was a bad person. You know, it's just, I was working three jobs. Like I was a resident advisor, I worked in student activities, and then on the weekends, I was a bouncer at a nightclub, you know, working from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. Like, you know, so, you know, yeah, it was hard for me to find time to study. And then when I wasn't like working, so I was just exhausted and tired, right? So, you know, my grades were very average at university. But because of that, I got passed up, which I think is why I ended up being so loyal to Enterprise because Enterprise wasn't so fixated on the GPA. They were looking at the bigger picture, like, okay, his GPA is not the highest, but look how many jobs he was doing at university. Obviously, there's a reason for that, right? Um, you know, so it's, It's, it's really, really interesting to, to see the different approaches on employers. 
you know, if they're fixated on grades or they fixated on this or they want only a top university. You know, if you go to a top key university, then it's going to be uh, a lot of scholarships that probably got on there, you know, coming from maybe a privileged or higher end background. But when you're first in the family to go to university and the family didn't make a lot of money, where I had to take out a lot of loans to pay for it. And it took me five years to get through university. Uh, so, yeah, it was a lot harder for me. Well, to be fair, I have no idea how should, uh, social mobility should work if you want people to be in the top business schools that are super expensive, have top grades, and have internships that are probably not always paid. How, how is that possible? Yeah. Right? So the, it's, it's like, a, it is like a, to be honest, I yeah. think it's a kind of a myth. Yeah. And, and therefore, yeah, it's really great that, that you appreciate people doing jobs that most of the or would most of students don't consider like super valuable. But uh, yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's yeah. like incredible, incredible experience you collect there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jeff. So we, I think we learned a lot. It was amazing to be here at Zalando. Is there anything else you would want our listeners or viewers to know about Zalando? How great of a career you can have here, and how it is working with you then in yeah, the end? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I think. You know, the last piece of advice I'd give to graduates out there in the market right now is that we understand and know that we're entering very challenging times. Uh, you know, there's words of a recession. Uh, and when these kind of things happen, and I've seen in the past, back when you look in 2008, students begin to panic. Uh, they're thinking, I'm not going to get a job when I graduate. They hit that panic button, and then it creates a, what we call spam applying where you know, students will just start applying anywhere and everywhere without thinking about, is this the right company for me? Is it the right uh, even role for me? And I think the best advice is don't panic, think it through, still do your research to make sure you're applying to the right roles and actually spend a lot of time you know, learning about that company, tailoring your CV. And I think if you put a lot of focus on it, you'll still get a role. So I think the important thing is don't panic utilize your network, go to your career mm -hmm. services because they work very closely with a lot of employers. They can maybe help open that door for you so that you can get an interview. Uh, but I think the main thing is don't panic. Uh, even if you're already working as an intern within an organization and things might be difficult for them, you know, again, still don't panic. Think about, you know, still giving it 110%, doing and delivering the best version of yourself and the work that you do. And really everything you do, put your name on it. You know, build your personal brand and put your stamp on everything that you do. Uh, but I think the main thing is, is, is don't panic. Things will get better. You'll find the right role. Uh, and I think if you dedicate yourself in the right way, you'll, you'll get there. Thanks a lot, Jay. That was very insightful indeed. And yeah, we connect the Zalando career community um, below the video. So if you have any questions to Jeff, um, you can reach out to him. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Awesome. Uh, it was amazing being here. Yeah, thank you so much.